On that note, I have tickets to go and watch Strictly for the Professionals and it's been cancelled twice. Two years I have waited, longed, longed to go and watch those Strictly Professionals prance up and down and round and round. But Claire's looking forward to it, so that's the main thing. Anyway, hopefully I will get there. So yes, so this morning's service, our all service, is looking about the past and the present and the future. And we thought it might be nice to do something a bit different so you don't have to just listen to me talk for absolutely ages. So we're going to talk to some people. Um, because what I've learned over the years as a Christian is that it's, it's quite hard to be a Christian, um, to live your life, to be a Christian, to talk to your friends about it. And one of the best things that I've ever done is actually just talk to people who are a bit further along in their, um, their uh, life as a Christian, because they have loads of experience and things that have happened to them that they can tell you about. Um, so we thought this morning what we would do is ask some people uh, to come and talk to us. So I'm going to ask Julia if she will um, come up and take a lovely seat next to me. So this is on Julia. You have one thing to hold the microphone and um, people at the back who I think you know quite well, some of them, um, they get a bit angry if you don't hold it close enough. So if I do this, Hello. that, that no. well, well, they'll turn it on. Don't worry, it's on. <laughs> they'll sort that. But if I do this, that's the only rule is you have to hold it a bit closer to your mouth. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. There's water there as well. That's fresh just for everyone. Um, I haven't touched the, the glass is clean. It's for you if you want it. So, um, so I've sent some pre-questions to these people, so it's not completely out of the blue um, what I'm going to ask um, Julia now. But Julia, tell us um, about where you grew up and, and, and your early days, your early life. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. This is where you think, why did I say yes? <laughs> Uh, so I grew up in Oldborough and there are some other people who, well, at least one other person who grew up in Oldborough here this morning. Uh, so uh, the seaside and the river were actually very much part of my childhood, especially in my mum's family, because her brother was coxswain of the lifeboat. He was an inshore fisherman. Her father had been a boatman and a fisherman and... Um, the river as well as the sea had been a big part of their lives so it was also kind of a big part of my life as well growing up. Um, I've got an older sister and you'll probably have met her because she used to come down very frequently when mum was living with us and so she could tell you all sorts of stories about her naughty little sister she had to uh, put up with. Um, we had two dogs but we didn't have them at the same time so we had them consecutively um, and my father ran a garage. So when I was born, apparently the midwife slapped my backside and said to mum, this will be the one that'll help Tony in the garage. And lo and behold, I had time when I was a student um, working on the garage forecourt and doing taxiing for him and so on. So just to clear up, if we have any mechanical issues, can you help with those? Is that... I might be able to put oil in the right place. Brilliant. Do radiators need filling up these days? I don't know. Not often, I don't think. I would no, probably no, no. say, I don't wouldn't. come to me. Okay, brilliant. I, I, I'm not joking. I had trouble shutting the boot of my car today. It wouldn't shut properly, so you could have helped. Um, yeah, that was a bit... Um, anyway, um, and last question. is This is extra, so I get... Because I get to interview you, I get to throw in extra questions. Are Oldborough Fish and Chips the best in the country? Whoa, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Look... <laughs> We'll come on to what Julieta did, but I think one of the key rules is you don't shout out, you put your hand up. Well, do you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, I don't actually really like fish and chips. Oh. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> no, that's fair enough. You so, can um, yeah, well, well, we always had fresh fish from um, my oh, uncle, you see, so oh, we were a bit spoiled. Okay, fantastic. And then, um, so, uh, I think it's fair to say you are a Christian, so tell us about, how did you become a Christian? What was that like? Did, who helped you understand what it was to be a Christian? That type of thing. Okay, yeah. So um, my mum had made a profession of faith when she was maybe a teenager, but she'd kind of drifted away by the time she got married. However, 
she thought it would be good to have a quiet Sunday morning, so she sent my sister and I down to Sunday school. And then I think she felt, oh, maybe, maybe I should also be going back to church. So um, I was sent to Sunday school, went quite regularly, and then went regularly on a Sunday with mum to church. But because my father was running his own business, he had the garage open on a Sunday morning. So he never came and he'd not been brought up in a Christian family and he had no, um, no need of God. He had um, no personal faith or anything. Um, so the church that we went to was, uh, we had a lot of good Bible teaching and I didn't have a problem believing that the world is created by a God because it just seems so amazing to me, this creation and the world that we live in. And I'm thinking this cannot have just happened by chance. But I suppose by the time I was about 12 or 13, um, I, was, I was sort of happy with that. But I thought I could make myself good enough for God. And one summer holiday, there was a girl doing a holiday job in Oldborough and she was not from Suffolk, and she asked a very direct question. So you might have noticed some of you who have come to Suffolk, um, were not born in Suffolk, that often Suffolk people don't ask direct questions. But this girl did not come from Suffolk, and she asked me a direct question, are you a Christian? And I knew that I could not say yes but I also knew that I didn't want to say no. So I tried to mutter something and change the subject very quickly. So that told her everything she needed to know. Um, but around about, well, a few, a few months later, there was a Dick Saunders Way to Life crusade being run up in Ipswich. Um, and mum and a group from church were going and she took me and my sister. And it was actually at that, service that I went to that um, I realized that I could not make myself good enough for God, that I needed to accept his grace and his forgiveness um, and that his great love for me as a sinner meant that I, I had no need to try. Um, so, so that was the point of, of change. I should say actually that Part of my childhood and, and the good Bible teaching that we had also came from Faith Mission and Chris's dad was helping lead a children's mission in Oldborough, um, maybe when I was about eight or nine, I don't know, I can't quite remember. So uh, I remember those evenings well, we'd all be packed into this little um, wooden hall which later became the Methodist Church and they had a stack of um, vinyls because they wanted to see if they could break the record of the number of children that were there on particular nights, so it was always all good fun, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was, that was where I would say um, my start point as a Christian began. Um, and the Lord's really blessed me. There have been so many people down through, down through the years, there's quite a few years, uh, who have really helped me as a Christian. But in those early days, one lady who was very helpful was my art teacher at school, secondary school. Now, I'm hopeless at art. I did do um, O-levels somehow or other. But in the sixth form, uh, we were allowed one afternoon a week to choose a topic or a, a private study session or sport or whatever that we could do. And I chose art. Poor lady, this art teacher had me turning up. But basically, it was because she was such a lovely Christian. She, had, she was well into retirement age. The school was short of an art teacher and they got her back. So by the time I was there, she was probably in her mid-70s, snowy white hair in a bun, quite a feisty character. Um, but she would just sit and talk. I'd have a whole afternoon. And, and she would just sit and talk about the Lord and about Christian life. Um, because I was, I think there were two others of us there. So I, I kind of did a bit of artwork, but, but she was really helpful. And the one thing that I particularly remember, and I think I must have been struggling with assurance. 
You know, I still had this sense that I had got to make myself good for God, for him to keep me as a Christian. Um, and she explained so helpfully, and I, I, I must have heard it before, but it really stuck, how she said, but God isn't looking at you, Julia, when, when he hears you pray and when you'll stand before him. He isn't looking at you. He's looking at the fact that you belong to his son and you are covered with the righteousness of Jesus. It's not your goodness. It's that you have said you need the righteousness of Jesus to cover you. And that's what he sees when he sees you. And he says, that's someone who my son Jesus has died for and is, they're covered by his righteousness. And yeah, so, so that was something I found very encouraging. That's fantastic. And it's wonderful to hear about your art teacher and how that affected your life. But then for people like myself who have young children, and I know many people out in our congregation will be so grateful for the way that you've nurtured our children um, in junior church and helped them. And I know you've given them lots of advice and support over the years, but if you could, if you could tell them now, I know you, you said about encouragement um, when I asked you this question, um, but yeah, I termed it originally as, as advice, but what advice or encouragement would you give to, to younger people who are maybe just become a Christian or still young in their Christian life or, or just young in general? Yeah, I know. I thought, oh goodness, that's really scary, isn't it? What advice would you give? I think, who am I uh, to give advice? So encouragement, yes, yeah, I think <laughs> that's what scripture says, doesn't it? Encourage one another. Um, so I think really just keep the main thing, the main thing, which is the gospel um, through Jesus. So keep Jesus central. So the gospel isn't just about, you know, pie in the sky when you die. The gospel has everything to say about how we live, our relationships, how we handle stuff when we get stuff wrong, um, and we all do that. And um, we have to come back again and again to Jesus' love shown at Calvary and just, yeah, decisions we make about our goals in life, what we think are important, um, all of that in the light of of the gospel and what Jesus has done. That's helpful, thank you. And um, one of the questions I asked was for you to pick your favourite um, favorite Bible verse. And I know, um, I find this with people that are good teachers, they, they don't like to follow the rules, do they? Um, <laughs> The, um, now you know what my yeah. sister said. I was a naughty little sister. <laughs> so tell us about tell the Bible verse. That, um, that you, do you want me to read it or, or do you yeah, want to you, say? Yeah, you read okay. it. Okay, so when I, I asked you, you said um, about Galatians 2.20, you said that lots of Bible verses over your life have been really poignant and helpful at different times. Um, but if you had to sort of choose one um, yeah. then um, from Galatians. So I'm just going to read Galatians 2.20 to you, which says this, that I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It, Julia, well, just briefly explain, why is that special to you? Um, well, I think the focus that, the beginning of it is quite hard, isn't it? I've been crucified with Christ, and I, I think that's a, a hard thing to claim. Um, but certainly the end of the verse, that Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, is something that I've had to hang on to at times when I, especially, you know, if I think I've really messed up. Um, so, yeah, just, just that is so amazing. They're absolutely fantastic words, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, so just to also add that um, the songs that we're singing this morning have all been chosen by the people that we're interviewing. So um, we're now going to um, uh, sing your song, Julia. So what, what is that song and why have you chosen it? Oh, oh, uh, that's another thing as well, because you don't like to follow rules. You chose two, <laughs> didn't you? I was going to so say, the I first thought we'd song, already sung it. <laughs> we, 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 I asked for one song and Julia said two, which is absolutely fine. Well, I didn't know I somebody else one. might have chosen one well, the same fine. as me and I would give you an alternative. So we sung before the throne of God above, um, but we're now going to sing, I've forgotten just second one, which did you chose? Here is love. Yes. Fast as the ocean. Why is that special to you? 
Um, well, I'm glad we had the first one first. Okay. <laughs> because that's, I think that's probably my all-time favourite. That's, I'm having that at my funeral. If anybody here is planning my funeral when it comes, can you remember that, please? Keith, have you made a note, Keith? You've got that. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to be there. What, you're going to oh, be a widow, are want... you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like I've gone... <laughs> Do you? Um, Do you? Yeah, I paid it. Why that song, Julia? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I could say, I suppose, because it was written by a woman um, way back in the 1800s, and um, we sang it quite a lot in the church we were in in Wales, and they had a very traditional view of women's ministry. Sorry, this is a bit of a digression. Um, and it just amused me that we would all sing very happily this song, which can be so prayerful, written by a woman. But I think it, it just is, when I've struggled with assurance, it's all there, isn't it? That we have someone who stands before the throne and whoever lives to plead for us. And I just, I was talking with a friend last week and she doesn't have that assurance, she follows another religion. And I thought, how, what, what a loss, what a lonely place to be that you might have to depend on your own goodness, but we don't, we have Jesus, yeah. And then here is love. <laughs> well, I think um, we sang that a lot in Wales as well. It's very Welsh, and God um, was very good to us in Wales, and it's always a reminder of good things that he did for us in Wales. Ah, oh, thank you, Julia. I'm going to take the microphone, not because I want you to stop, but because um, I know what it's like having to hold a microphone. Um, the one thing I'm going to ask, sometimes in church, we're really reluctant to clap people, but do you know what? Even for Julia, who's very good at standing up the front and teaching people and, and our children and that, it's actually really nerve-wracking coming up to the front to talk about your life and what it's like, and I really appreciate it. So I'm going to encourage you, as I walk to the piano so that we can sing and play um, Here Is Love Vast As The Ocean, I would really like you to give Julia a big round of applause as she takes her seat. Thank you, Julia. If you would come up. It's like mastermind, isn't it? Angela Irene Wig. Your specialist subject is your life. <laughs> Hello, Mumsy. Hello. She loves being called Mumsy. <laughs> there we are. Same rule applies. If I do this, you're in trouble. So, Mumsy. Son. A little bit more. Well done. So, tell us about your early life. Okay then. Uh, what sounds loud? It doesn't matter. They'll sort that. Okay. You just have to talk. Okay. So, my name is Angie Wig, and I am a Suffolk gal, born and bred. My mum, dad, and brother lived in the village of Fressingfield, my mum, dad and my brother all lived in the village of Fressingfield until I was nearly seven when we moved to Hadley Road, Sprong. Early memories of Fressingfield include visiting my beloved granddad Robert in his cottage that had no water or electricity and had an outside toilet. On the way home from his, I would peek round the corner of the blacksmith's forge to watch the horses having new shoes. I was always welcomed as it was owned by my dad's best friend. At the bottom of the road was a beck where Uncle George and I used to, pl used to play poo sticks. The farm at Sproughton gave my brother Michael and me a chance to roam the fields. We used to feed the animals and we played in the barns. We enjoyed harvest time and picking up potatoes in the October half term. My parents are Christians and I spent time staying with my aunt who was also my godmother. She worked for a vicar who had been a missionary and I read lots of articles and prayer letters from Africa. Another aunt also worked for a vicar and her husband was a church organist. So you're a local girl, brought up in Suffolk, born and bred, just down the road at Sporton. And, and um, yeah, fantastic. You, brought, you, were, you were brought up in, uh, uh, with Christian parents, you went to Sunday school, and you've got really 
fond memories of your, your childhood growing up. Um, so tell us about how you became a Christian then. What was that like? Okay, um, I went to the um, local school. Um, um, it was Church of England school, so we used to spend a lot of time um, in actually the village church um, doing different things. Um, <clears throat> I went to Sunday school and also at home I grew up hearing stories of Daniel and Noah, Jonah, etc. Um, and then when I was 11 years old, my Sunday school class was held in the choir stalls in the church at Sproughton. The teacher's name was Doreen and she told and explained the gospel. I re remember being astounded that someone would die for me. However, later I wondered if it was really true, um, you know, fickle of youth and sort of thing, you question things, don't you? So I prayed every night for around six months that I would see a change in my character that in my view was a problem. Then a test came and I found I could face up to things that would before break my heart. Now God never took this character trait away, but he showed me how to cope and channel my feelings and rely on him in these situations. After this, I explained I was a, now a believer and I was confirmed at 12 years old. Fantastic. So once again, just like when we were speaking to Julia, Sunday school was a really vital part of you growing up and becoming a Christian. And actually having someone um, called Doreen um, for you was, was fantastic because she was much further on. She was able to teach and help and help you to learn. But also the thing I picked out was that it wasn't suddenly, oh, I'm a Christian and everything's perfect and rosy. Life doesn't just change because you suddenly say, well, yeah. Jesus Christ is my saviour. No, that's right. Life is hard and, it, and things have, you have to learn and change and grow. Yes. Yeah. So Very that's really so. important, isn't it? Yes. So for our younger people, um, what, would you, what advice, what, um, what would you say to them um, as they learn to grow as a Christian? Well, I think if you don't understand something, then to ask either your parents or at Sunday school and things, don't bottle things up and try to work them out for yourself. Just try and get as much um, help as you can to understand things. And also to ask for prayer about it because there's such a great value in prayer. I can't stress enough how valuable prayer is in all our lives. Mm. Yeah, and I've certainly learned that a lot, that actually, you know, people say, oh, there's no stupid questions, but actually you still think, oh, that is pretty stupid, but actually there, there aren't. If you don't know the answer to something, you don't know the answer to it. And, and actually just asking somebody, I don't know the answer to this, um, actually is really helpful for you, but it's helpful for them as well, because they get to help learn to explain it to you, and they get to be reminded of the wonderful um, Christian life mm -hmm. and what Jesus has done for them. So there really are, in the Christian life, there are absolutely no stupid questions that you um, can ask. So I asked you um, to pick your favorite Bible verse, and you chose Psalm 121 for me. So I'm gonna read that now, and then you can tell us why you've chosen that. So Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord and maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Tell us why you chose that. Um, because God never asks us to cope with, uh, he knows us inside out and he, he will never ask us to cope with something that he knows we can't cope with. Um, in our, my later life, I've been very privileged. I've been to China six times, to Sierra Leone and to South Africa on short-term mission trips. And some of the things I've come across have been horrendous. Um, 
And going back to um, my character trait and that, and the way that over the years God has taught me how to cope with that and rely on him. Um, this um, psalm also um, just confirms that um, he is with us and that. And some of the things that um, I've come across in those trips can be re had, could have been really scary and could have been um, quite frightening, really, and heartbreaking. Um, and although it does touch your heart and it does have an effect on you greatly and that, he, 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 he teaches you that, you know, you can cope and you can rely on him and he never lets you go. He's always with you. Mm. They're wonderful, aren't they? Wonderful words and wonderful promise to us in those words. And lastly, the, the hymn that you chose is I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Just tell us briefly why you've chosen that. Um. Well, I'm so glad that we started singing it in church again. <laughs> um, my only copy is on cassette tape. And oh, I, hang on, I might have to explain to some people. Hang what on, that I was going to say, <laughs> lately I've had to explain to grandchildren what a cassette is and what a tape is. As you can see, I have no posh phone, I, we have no really technology in the house as such and that so notes are written out scribbled out and what have you and we still play cassette tapes um, so that, that, that's been quite funny really um, but it's such a short start, um, song but to me it takes me back to being 11 years old in that choir store when I was amazed and astounded that God died for me, mm. you know, or Jesus died for me, you know, mm. and it's just, I just think it's wonderful, and I've also got that on my list for my funeral, so oh I, just warn, I just warn you. <laughs> no pressure when you come up here, but, oh dear, I mean, oh, um, okay, lovely, well, that's fantastic, no, it's good, I mean, why wouldn't you choose uh, one of your most favourite hymns that tells the gospel message at your funeral, in fairness? Um, it's a wonderful thing to have, isn't it? Um, we have such an array of music that we can choose from. It's a wonderful thing. So um, once again, I'm going to take your microphone. And as you go to walk that way, and I walk that way, I'm going to ask everyone to give uh, Angela a wonderful round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, well, no pressure, Clifford. You should know. <laughs> You can shout at yourself if you, yeah, if you don't hold it in the right place. Yeah, I, can I just say, I did get a bit worried about what Claire was saying. Um, which she bit? said, very young, and then she was about to say, and very old. Well, I know she hesitated, and then she said something like, older. Older, yeah. <laughs> yeah, can you tell she's a nurse? She's quite yeah, used to talking yeah, to people that are older, and then having yes. to think really carefully what about she what says. she has to actually say. Well... Thank you for being an older person within our congregation willing to talk to us at the front. Cliff, tell us about your early life. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was um, brought up in West London, so most of my uh, young life was in, in Hounslow, which is a few miles from Heathrow Airport. Okay. So I didn't have any sea and sand to look at. We had underground trains and the uh, planes flying through the middle of the high street. They used to line <laughs> up for the runway straight down the middle of the high street. Um, the early days, of course, that didn't happen very much, but uh, as it got to the sort of 1960s, uh, I remember the Boeing 707s, which were the really noisy ones. And they used to line up directly above our the schools and uh, our church, in fact, and you know, they used to have to stop while the planes were across. <laughs> and since they came across at least every two to three minutes, it, was, uh, it took a bit longer to get through the service <laughs> or to get through the songs um, and to get through the schools, but uh, yeah. Uh, that, that's where we, we, we live. My parents, um, uh, they were very much churchgoers indeed, but um, they, they were sort of first generation Christians, so my grandparents didn't go to church or have anything to do with church at all. I think it was because um, in, in the 1930s when my parents were around, they would go to Sunday school regularly anyway, uh, just an automatic thing. So they sent the children off to Sunday school, particularly my, uh, my mum's side of the family because they ran a gross, greengrocer's shop and Sunday was actually their only day off. So my mum's job when she was a teenager was cleaning through the house on Sunday mornings, and then she went off to Sunday school in the afternoon so grandma could have a sleep, okay. and granddad could have a sleep. And so she went there quite regularly. 
Yeah. And it was from there that she learned about Christian things and became a Christian eventually. In fact, during the, the war, when she was probably 16, 17, 18, a lot of the men had gone off to war mm. and she was running the Sunday school in her teens. Right. Um, my dad was in a similar situation. He, he was, um, his parents, I think if you're looking back in the records, they, they, they were actually launderers because Acton, where they lived, was the centre for all the laundry, for all the hotels in London. It was all sent out to Acton, out of town. And there were lots and lots of launderers there. So he had, you know, and, and they didn't go to church or anything. So somehow my, my dad decided to go into the civil service and my mum, she initially learned how to do typing and things like that, but it became uh, uh, what was known at the time as a housewife. Okay. Fantastic. And just for absolute clarity, launderers of linen, not money. That's correct, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just I, don't, I don't think they, did, they hadn't invented launderers of money then. <laughs> yeah, but the, the other odd thing was my dad, I mean, he was... Uh, it, in the later stage of the war, he was uh, drafted in because he was in his late teens. He was been 18, 19. And uh, for some reason, they decided the Navy was the best place for him. He couldn't swim. <laughs> He'd never seen the, swim. He'd hardly seen the sea, I don't think. But anyway, they decided the Navy was a good idea for him. And while he was there, could he train as an electrician? Okay. Bear in mind, he was an administration type person. He'd never seen any do it yourself in those days. But they decided he would become an electrician. So. He attended a series of lectures, which he had a little notebook, which actually I, I got hold of when, when I was younger, you know, going through some of his mm -hmm. stuff that he had. He showed me this book and he said he, he might be interested. And that showed how to wire up lighting sockets and um, two way switching for stairs and how to join the cables together in the old fashioned way. So that sort of sparked a bit of an interest in me with, with electrical things. Right. And uh, it's a good joke. Yeah, like <laughs> it comes. But, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I took on sort of electricity as, a, as an idea and I, I followed it through a bit. In fact, by the time I was 15, 16, I was actually, a lot of houses in those days had the old fashioned rubber wiring. Mm -hmm. So they all needed rewiring. So myself and my friend used to go around all our uh, <laughs> church members <laughs> rewiring their houses at weekends just for a sort of pastime. So I, I, I sometimes think back and think, well, how many houses are there still standing that haven't burnt down yet? <laughs> So but, just to be clear from what we have learnt this morning, if you need mechanical issues, you need to see Julia. If it's farming <laughs> issues, you need to see my mum. And if it's electrical, you need to come and see Cliff, OK? But, <laughs> so Cliff, you've, you've talked about Sunday school, church, yeah. and that. So how did that play into you becoming a Christian? Yeah, and what, I mean... What happened? Certainly in my sort of younger teens, I would go three times a day. We would have a Sunday school in the afternoon, like uh, others mentioned. That was a regular thing. So I would go to morning service, Sunday school, and an evening service usually. And from that, I sort of, over the years, learned a lot about the scriptures, about God, about Jesus, and all that he'd done for us. And I think by the time I was about 12, um, in one particular Sunday evening service, they, you know, they, we were able to go and have a chat to the preacher, because we didn't have a formal ministers in our churches. It was all done by visiting preachers. And I had a chat with them, and uh, that's when I became a Christian when I was about 12. Mm -hmm. and, um, by the time I was 15, 16, 16, 17, I was baptized in our church as well. So that's what started off. And we, I used to attend a Bible class and a youth group that we had. And that sort of gave me sort of mentors to uh, keep us mm. uh, working on that. So that, that's where I sort of started off. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And, and uh, again, same question we've asked the others. If you had to give some advice or encouragement to, to, to people in the congregation, what would that be? Well, I guess, from my point of view, it's sticking at it because everything changes so much around us. Mm. Um, we've actually got to keep on this steady, straight path and keep watchful. I mean, even for me in my younger, year, younger years that I am, that, um, it, the, the change has been so dramatic. Mm. You know, apart from technology and social media and um, the way the laws of the country have altered and changed, mm. it's... it's dramatic and you've got it's very hard then to sort of stick at it and to to line yourself up with what is actually the, the, the basic truths okay and um yeah that's yeah fine. and that ties in really nicely to the bible verse that you chose yeah, which fine. was um uh, hebrews 13 verse 8 which says um jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever why did you yeah. choose that but that that was um 
over the, as they often did in those days, over the top of the pulpit in our church when I was growing up. So right from the time when I was about five, we used to go there mm. till I was 20 odd. And uh, that one was always over there. And so that's why I, I'm not really good necessarily remembering verses. I remember cabling, cabling connections and <laughs> numbers. <laughs> words no they're not so important sometimes to me so but that one does stick in my mind jesus christ same yesterday today very well i can't remember where it came from that's hebrews 13 <laughs> verse 8 so it sticks in there uh, right from my young days and as i say that ties in really nicely like you say the world is just changing so quickly and rapidly isn't it you know and what was current yesterday is not necessarily current a good electrical joke do you like that one yeah, yeah. um it's not necessarily current to power, do power in it, so yeah, yeah yeah a lot of power in it um <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, it's what was current yesterday. It's not current today, is it? And so the world around us is changing so rapidly. And yet it's a wonderful verse that reminds us that, that God is, the, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. He never changes. He's exactly the same. Lastly, just moving on to the song that you chose, which is a faithful one. I just want to read some of the words. I, I love this song that you've chosen as well. Not that I don't love the others, but this is wonderful. And, and this, again, ties into your verse really well. It says, you are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. Absolutely fantastic words, aren't they, Cliff? Thank you so much, Cliff. Uh, once again... I know we don't like to do it, but we do need to encourage people. Um, and I want to give Cliff a, a fantastic round of applause as he takes his seat um, for, for being willing to come and talk to us this morning. So thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you.